So in the sake of time, uh, we're going to get things started. I'm going to keep it pretty simple. Uh, we'll handle questions at the end. The full panel will join us up here at the end uh, on stage. And um, we, you know, I think that so far we've had a lot of uh, academics encourage us to be brave when it comes to parking. And uh, I think our panel will um, not dump water on that. But uh, we have three people from governments here, and they'll tell us about dealing with parking on our uh, on the ground, and uh, I think they all have some interesting stories to share with us. First, we have Megan Jopp, uh, the Deputy Director of General Government Services from the Town of Wellesley. Um, Megan also served as Planning Director, started with the City as a Planner. Uh, she's mainly focused on the administration of town services, zoning, affordable housing, and promoting redevelopment in the village districts in Wellesley. So um, she has a very interesting story of a redevelopment project that was on a, a large See of parking, I would describe it as the beginning stage stage um, of that development project. Uh, Scott Hamway, if I pronounce that correctly, uh, is from uh, MassDOT's Office of Transportation Planning. He's managed a wide range of planning projects, all with interesting names, 28X, Urban Ring, Silver, uh, the Silver Line Gateway for the MBTA project, um, Beyond Boston study for the uh, Massachusetts Regional Transit Authorities, and for the Patrick Administration Way Forward, and We Move Massachusetts statewide strategic plan. Um, and Melissa Tatopoulos, um, who is the current economic development director for the town of Lexington. Uh, we hold a, a warm place in our hearts in Somerville for her. She formerly worked for the city. Um, she installed the Massachusetts first parklet and uh, installed a pilot commuter shuttle connecting the leafy suburb of Lexington to the red line. And I can assure you that people from Cambridge probably thank her for taking cars off the street. Uh, and she's also uh, leading a development um, of new parking policy for their town center. So without further ado, um, I'll introduce Megan. Good afternoon. Um, the project I'm going to talk about is called the Linden Square Redevelopment Project. Um, so the large water area, this eventually became parking. This is a flyover from 1930 of Linden Street. Um, this is Linden Street here. And it was a real spur and really the industrial district for the town. It started off as the Ice House and uh, owned by Deals, F. Deals and Sons. And they owned the property for... Um, almost 125 years. So this is a it's sort of an angle picture, but this is from um, 1960. And what you can see is the land was filled in largely by dump. It was a town dump back in 1950. And it became a, uh, the ice house, once abandoned, became a, um, a lumber yard. So the industrial district continued. And what happened is F. Deal and Sons kept building to suit the needs of their business as it grew. So they had a hardware store, they had a lumber store. They started branching out to other um, retail components. And, and basically the zoning changed. So it became a split zone of industrial and business. And essentially had 15 buildings scattered with really no rhyme or reason to it. Um, and I'll show you a picture in a, a second. That equated to about 225,000 square feet of uh, floor area. And essentially, that was broken up into heavily service-oriented uses. A grocery store, Roach Brothers, was located on the site. I'll indicate where it was located. Um, a lumber yard, which had heavy traffic um, for tractor trailers and large equipment, um, surrounded by a residential neighborhood. The town in 1994 had begun to look at all its village districts and said, how can we improve them? Let's come up with a plan and think of long range plans to do that. And essentially broke out each district into a phase study. First, a vision, second, a master plan, and third, an action plan to implement the master plan. So when we began the phase for visioning for Linden Square, when we got to it, this is essentially what the site looked like. So you can see this is the lumber yard. These are some of the existing retail businesses. And really, the purple is all, was all owned in one ownership, F. Deal and Sons here. 
The grocery store, Roach Brothers, was located here. Now given the odd shape, you, you want to see it over here because the parking field is, is so narrow. And what had happened over time with the planning of parking was it was just a hodgepodge. And so I, I tried to zoom in on this aerial to give you a sense of what um, the town was dealing with and what the property and tenant were dealing with. And you can, if you, you can sort of see some of the arrows, but I'll, I'll zoom into a portion to give you a sense. All different types of directions. The north side of the street had over six curb cuts, some of them really wide, and the south side had seven curb cuts, again, really wide. Um, there was a hodgepodge of different parking. There's angled parking, parallel parking, all different uh, one ways. Um, the, the loop on the drive-through, the, the entire site functioned this way where, and, and as you can see, there's really no outside of the street any pedestrian amenities to get from building to building to building. Um, on the south side of the street, one of the good things that came out of it was the parking was so tough in front of the grocery store that Roach Brothers instituted this, we'll bring the food to your car so there's no carriage corrals, which saved some of the parking lot there and saved some parking. But at the time, um, there was, let's see, a little over 580 parking spaces on this entire site. And um, it's slightly skewed, I'll go back one, because there's VW, which is over here. And so a lot of that isn't parking, it was really storage for, for vehicles, so it looks like more parking per se, but it was all pavement um, with minimal interior landscaping. So here's some images just to give you a, a sense. This is one of the entrances. Um, you know, no directional signage, no stop bars. Um, pretty wide curb cuts, although they also then have bad planting, so when you're pulling out, it it's, was difficult to see. This was really the type of signage that was there and the, and the type of um, buildings, some of them over 100 years old, which would just have additions. There was really no um, scheme to any of the buildings. So the parking fields had minimal uh, interior landscaping. Um, the spaces ranged between seven and a half and eight and a half feet in width. Um, seven and a half is our standard under zoning for the compact spaces. Our regulations now say that you should have a minimum of uh, a maximum of 30%. I think um, this current site had upwards of 40 or 45 percent of the spaces um, at seven and a half feet wide. This was the main curb cut into the grocery store, which was. Um, Believe it or not, the, of all the wide curb cuts, the narrowest curb cut. And at the time, in 2001, when we had begun looking at the visioning, we took a look at the, at the accident data. And in 2001, there were 40 accidents over a two and a half year period on, these, um, on the premises. That, and they were mostly rear and end crashes. Um, the, the building pla placement and the parking configuration um, led you know, to most of that. Um, these were some of the, how it interacted with the Volkswagen dealership. This is coming around um, from one of the buildings through the drive through These are the sidewalk conditions. Um, the, the crosswalks were, were really minimal as well in terms of striping. They were six to eight feet wide, um, ve not very prominent, particularly in the evening. The lighting was poor on the street. Um, there's no, this is a very, um, it was a heavily, it's a heavily traveled cut through, which is essentially between Route 16, Washington Street, and Route 9. Um, and it's surrounded by a residential neighborhood. The middle school is located on the street. And we had high speeds, high volume. The sidewalks are, at this point are four and a half to five feet wide. Minimal um, elevation above the street, really about uh, three inches curb reveal at this time. And no landscape separating the road and the, and the sidewalk. There was no buffer. So this was a way to try and control the direction and flow within the parking fields. Um, because there was no rhyme or reason, they inserted the Jersey barriers to try and redirect flow. So in 2001, when we began the vision, it was an interesting process where the property owners really were against any action from the town at all. They said, we've owned this site for 125 years. We're never changing. We're never selling. 
And we think the site's great. It works for what it is. It's a service industry for the town. Uh, we're a lumber yard. I don't see any reason for beautification. The tenants, on the other hand, like Roach Brothers, um, there were some small businesses in the area. Um, some small uh, banks were in the area as well. They said, well, maybe we could stand for some beautification. And it really became a political struggle where the planning board is trying to put this vision forward for the district, which is 90% occupied by this particular site. So it became sort of a soft approach from the public hearing standpoint. And what came out was to maintain the existing character, um, to enhance pedestrian safety, you know, really sort of those low-hanging fruit, uh, improve the pedestrian experience. And, and interesting, when they were saying improve the pedestrian experience, they were talking on the road, not talking within the site, which is where most pedestrians are traveling um, to enhance the appearance of the street. Everything was centered to the street. It was this, well, the property's, you know, okay for now, more long-term parking. And what happened, in our other districts, we have public parking. In this area, given the expanse of land, there is public parking, but further out, so it's not as beneficial to this particular property. And they were saying, well, the town should deck that lot. The town should add parking. And we kept saying, there, there might be simple solutions here where we could just reorient your parking to improve it and increase your flow. And um, to enhance the residential areas on the street. The residents were saying, if we're going to do something, let's do something big because it's going to improve. We're here. We're next to a lumber yard. We're okay being next to a lumber yard, but maybe it can just look better. And um, they wanted to create some consistency with some of our other districts. Uh, it's in Linden Street is within walking distance to Wellesley Square, which is really the premier sort of district. So we hired Dufresne Henry. Uh, Ted Brovitz was on the team, and uh, Ted did a great job for us, as well as Peter Jackson. And Ted, since then, is, is actually with Howard Stein Hudson working on the town's off-street parking um, plan as we speak. So the scope was really to look at the circulation. Um, really, it became a beautification and circulation and pedestrian safety plan. And, but the planning board said, you know what? When we get into this master plan, let's just think what we really want. Let's just think 50 years down the road. And so they talked about the public improvements, but they, the planning board really gave a lot of credence to um, the consultants and said, show us really like how could we improve this site? And the stakeholders kept raising this back and forth of, well, we're never doing that. We're never going to sell it. And it, it became pretty contentious. Um, the tenants really wanted to see something, and, but they were thinking, even if you put it on the books, if someone comes in, even if a piece of the site is sold, we kept thinking incrementally buildings may be sold off um, or, or condoized in some way. So, and the other key component was that the zoning should remain the same. And the zoning in Wellesley has um, a pretty low FAR of, of 0.3. And essentially, we didn't, we didn't change that significantly. So this was the build out that Dufresne Henry came up with. And some of the, the key elements were really bringing buildings to the street, creating very consistent parking layouts. And this was the whole corridor. But essentially, this here, maintaining the, lum the lumber yard uh, and just really improving the south side of the street and bringing some uniformity. These were the larger um, pedestrian street crossing improvements, trying to create access to link both the north side and the south side of the street. So that day that was never going to happen, happened. And Eastern Development purchased the property in 2005. And the first thing they did is they came to the planning department and said, what would the town like to see here? And we handed over the master plan. This is what the neighbors said. This is what the town said. Here's our plan. We would like to see um, maybe the road widen. We'd like to see um, affordable housing on the site, maybe more of a mixed use. So we began the process of going through a rezone and creating an overlay. The other thing the town did was create a development agreement, which I'll get into in a second. So uh, during the process after the permitting, Federal Realty acquired the property. But largely, this was um, a partnership with Eastern Development. The uh, overlay was created, which really allowed for a very minimal increase to the FAR to 0.35 in exchange for a couple of things. One, an increase in open space. There had to be pocket parks. There had to be um, 
uh, over 10% of the site as open space. There was, um, the parking was going to be nine feet in width, which was them, not us, because it was uh, primarily gonna serve Roach Brothers, which was gonna become their anchor tenant. And they wanted to make sure that um, the spaces were wide enough for those people with groceries. They also maintained that Roach Brothers would keep this door to door, door to car service where they could eliminate the carriage corrals. The, um, the other, as I move forward, the Volkswagen, that was supposed to be phased out as part of our development agreement, but since that time, that's um, been maintained and they've come back to the town for amendments, so that's gonna be with, um, on Linden Street for another 20 years, so now we're, we're working to improve that site. So as part of the development agreement, the town got some, got straight up money uh, we got over four million dollars in money, um, but we also did a couple things. We we got a loop, uh, an Opticon system, for our traffic lights, which really went through most of our commercial districts, which um, was installed and paid for by Eastern or Federal. Um, they increased the parking space with. We created a downtown look to the street, and the way we did that is um, they granted the town a perpetual easement, which allowed us to widen the road to create turning lanes. Um, and to, we, we ended up having to install a light. Um, On-street parking spaces and metered and um, very wide sidewalks. So it has much more of a boulevard feel now. They also allowed for, um, we also mandated on-site bicycle accommodations. And part of the plan we also, even though we didn't have a bus route, we um, had them put in a layout for a bus thinking down the line. And as a matter of fact, the town just got MWRTA um, service. so. You know, as time marches on, sometimes our plans do come to fruition. So this is again, Linden Square. Um, this is uh, 1997. So I have a couple circles. These are some of the main buildings that um, stayed and were really, they were just spruced up. But when I look at the plan, so they're, they're still here. Um, the plan was to add two buildings to the front, uh, to add a building over here with a change in use. This is the VW parcel. Um, to do a, a, a large addition to this, it was essentially a shed, and to bring Roach Brothers from this area, which is incredibly narrow, to the larger parking field to the north. So, so this is the aerial of the site now. Very uniform parking, um, turning lanes, very wide streets, reduction in curb cuts, um, and the look compared to the previous pictures. So this is, this is a, a look uh, directly at, this is Roach Brothers under construction, um, but you can get a sense of the green in the parking field. This is a, a pedestrian walkway that goes across the street, very wide um, crosswalks, eight foot internal, 10 foot external brick. This is uh, the, known as 200 to the um, east. This is to the, the building that was a shed that had an addition. They ended up just doing straight up new construction. They also had to create, as part of the pocket parks, these common areas, which have been really successful, particularly because it's all under one ownership in terms of community events. Um, this is the large uh, pedestrian aisle that breaks up most of the lot. You can get anywhere on the site on a sidewalk. These are some of the um, connections. They also created outdoor um, eating spaces to really liven up the street, which was, uh, when I say service industry, you never even saw people out there unless they, they were trying to get to their house. So we have um, several restaurants on the site with outdoor seating, and, and it's really, in addition to the common spaces, really reinvigorated the street. A lot of um, pedestrian amenities along the way, significant landscaping. Um, again, bike. These are just really trying to show the connections. This is one a, a better shot of the common area, which uh, this particular little pocket park is about 6,000 square feet. This is a good, um, this is the, the new pedestrian walking experience as you're walking down Linden Street you're incredibly buffered and screened from, from the traffic flow, which, ha which has increased obviously from the improved um, retail components on the site and restaurant uses. So, so the hours are, 
um, higher volume are longer, but it's much more efficient. Um, this is the on-street parking to give you a sense we created. So this is all within perpetual easement. Um, so it allowed us to widen the road, create on-street parking, and again, to, to keep those wide sidewalks. And that's it. <coughs> Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Scott Hamway. As Dan mentioned, I'm with MassDOT's uh, Office of Transportation Planning, and I'll be talking about uh, the opportunities we have to improve public transit service in uh, urban areas if we're willing to make some tough choices with, uh, with parking and, and travel lanes. When we had our uh, prep call for this uh, session, I actually um, suggest that maybe I could go in the middle between Megan and Melissa because they're both, they're both telling generally positive stories that have positive outcomes about uh, sacrificing some parking, whereas my, my story doesn't really have a, a happy ending, at least as far as uh, removing parking goes. But let's see. Um, just for those who aren't familiar, most of you probably are by now, MassDOT, uh, the agency I work for, was created in 2009 as part of the transportation reform legislation. Uh, it consolidated uh, several formerly independent transportation agencies into one um, consolidated statewide multimodal uh, transportation agency. Um, we're organized around four modal divisions that you see up there on the screen. And where I work in the Office of Transportation Planning, we're uh, considered an enterprise service. So we actually do work across all four of the operating divisions, although uh, my work has tended to focus on uh, the rail and transit division. Uh, you're also probably familiar with our, you know, well-documented funding challenges that we've had in, in funding transportation improvements over the past decade or more. Uh, the most recent attempt by the Patrick administration to address uh, this, this funding shortfall was the Way Forward Finance Plan, which was submitted a year ago, January. Uh, the legislature last summer came up with some significant additional new revenues uh, for us, although they were still, you know, less than half of what the, what the governor had uh, had requested, and as we've started to program um, those new funds um, through our recent capital investment plan, what's become clear is that you know we just we simply don't, as a state or as a commonwealth, uh, have the same capacity to um, expand public transportation through you know very capital intensive rail rapid transit projects. The the Green Line extension to Somerville and Medford is really you know the, the last thing on the horizon right now as far as urban you know rail improvements and and it's but it's going to be important for us to continue to make those improvements because we all want to we all uh, believe that we need to continue to provide better public transit options if we're going to continue to grow the economy if we're going to continue to see the same kind of population growth in urban centers that that we've been talking about today. And, and even if we're gonna meet MassDOT's own aggressive uh, policy goals, like our aggressive uh, mode shift goal to triple the share of non-motorized uh, trips um, over the next uh, 15 years. So bus rapid transit, which I'll talk about today, is really an opportunity to, to make some you know, transformative uh, changes, provide some good uh, transit um, capacity access, uh, but, to, but to do it in a more uh, modest way, at least in terms of expense, than, than rail rapid transit. Um, so what is bus rapid transit for those who, <clears throat> who aren't in the know? It's, it's basically uh, based on the principle that if you, give, um, if you give rubber tire buses all the same advantages that we, that we tend to associate with rail rapid transit, that buses can provide an, an equivalent and, in, and in, some, in some ways uh, even a better uh, level of service uh, than rail. Uh, a lot of our thinking on bus rapid transit, we look to the Institute for Transportation and Development Policy. They're a... Uh, internationally recognized uh, leader in, in advocacy and planning for BRT systems that's based in New York. And they put out a great document called the BRT Standard, which um, outlines what all of the, the good elements of bus rapid transit are. And they, they rate the, 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 the countries and the, and the world's uh, BRT systems against a, a scoring uh, system. So we look to them for, for guidance. And you see some of the elements up there that, that go into good uh, bus rapid transit, off-board fare collection, so people aren't queuing up to pay when they board the bus. Certainly high frequency, high capacity vehicles, uh, better station spacing than you would normally associate with buses. Uh, and then the big one, probably the biggest one of them all is, is, is at the bottom there, um, having, a, having a segregated right of way. And that can be done a couple different ways, but the, 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 the most likely way to do it um, is, is to, is to um, implement BRT and implement a segregated right of way within our own existing street system uh, in the urban environment. And in order to do that, you obviously 
have two choices uh, most of the time. You either can take travel lanes or you can take on-street parking. And that's kind of where we start to run into some of the challenges with, uh, with BRT, which is a great concept, but we've, we've, we've had some kind of challenges getting to, to implementation. Um, so I'm gonna talk about, we, we've, we've done a number of, um, over the past 10 years, MassDOT and the T has pursued a number of uh, either bus rapid transit or higher order bus improvement projects. Um, and I'm gonna speak about two of those, uh, the 28X um, project in Roxbury, Dorchester, Mattapan, and the Silver Line Gateway project in East Boston and Chelsea. So um, we'll start with the 28X. You know, we get criticized a lot for, um, you know, how we've implemented BRT or things that we've called BRT in the past. And I would, I would just say that uh, it's, it's not for lack of trying that we haven't implemented a, a gold standard or a high standard BRT. The, uh, the 28X was a really aggressive um, project by MassDOT where we were looking to spend uh, about $170 million of, of federal economic stimulus funds to uh, replace the existing Route 28 bus, um, which is, you know, it's, it's very crowded, it's, it, it's on congested streets, to replace that service with a uh, high quality BRT system, the centerpiece of which would have been a um, three mile uh, um, physically segregated busway down the center of Blue Hill Avenue from Roxbury to, to Mattapan. Um, and this was this was a project we thought was a was was a great idea. We, we were really behind it because this is it's not just about Route 28 in these communities. There's actually an, a number of, of very crowded bus routes that provide service in this area. There's not great direct um, rail rapid transit access, and uh, in, in fact, the, the MBTA has a has a uh, subset of their buses they they consider key bus routes, and those are the 15 highest ridership, highest frequency bus routes. Five of those 15 routes operate within this corridor. So this was an opportunity not just to improve the 28, but to improve, um, you know, improve all of the all of the uh, services in this corridor. Um, however, when we went out uh, publicly with the project, and some of my colleagues from that experience are in the room, um, the the response was not quite uh, what we would have expected to get uh, from the public. It was an overwhelmingly, uh, I think it's fair to say, it was an overwhelmingly negative uh, public process. And that's, that's due to a whole host of things, not, not only parking. Um, I think the, the pace with which we had to advance the project, given the, the, the um, uh, res restrictions under the stimulus funding, was, was a very aggressive pace. It was hard to get people comfortable with this concept. Um, there had been a history in some portions of the corridor, corridor of, of advocacy for rail rapid transit so, or light rail, so that we were up against that history. And then there was all those things that the community was going to have to sort of give up in order to allow us to make this, this very significant improvement. And that was street trees that, that were planted in the median of Blue Hill Avenue, the median itself, which people viewed as a sort of pedestrian um, you know, refuge for, for crossing a fairly wide street. Um, some turning movements were going to have to go away. But, um, so it's not fair to blame the ultimate death of this idea on on-street on parking, but certainly parking was another big a big part of the challenge for us. Um, so what would this project have done for parking? Uh, this, this project was essentially was gonna result in the elimination of on-street parking at, at one of two different um, locations or conditions. Uh, any, any time we were gonna have a bus rapid transit station in the middle of Blue Hill Avenue, the additional width that we were gonna require to have station platforms uh, similar to the ones you would see on a, on a rail system, um, we were going to have to do that at the expense of on-street parking at, at that on, on that segment of the street. Um, the other place was left turn movements. We made an effort to eliminate as many left turns uh, in the corridor to improve the efficiency of the of the 28X service. Uh, but there were some left turns you just simply needed to, to preserve. And whenever we preserve those left turn lanes, that also came at the expense of parking. Um, in terms of numbers. We were uh, looking at taking, uh, over, over the length of the 28, which is a fairly long route, we were looking at taking about 250 on-street parking spaces. Um, yeah, I wanna point out these weren't, you know, it wasn't like 250 in a row, as I said, they were kind of scattered throughout the corridor. Um, and this is a corridor where <clears throat> it depends on the time of day, certainly for, for most of the day in most places in, along Blue Hill Avenue, it's, it's not difficult to find a parking space within a block of your destination. Uh, obviously, you know, there's a lot of churches on the corridor, so you can kind of throw that out the window on Sunday when there's church services going on. But, but this isn't um, as parking constrained a corridor as some of the other ones you'd see uh, closer into town. Um, you know, that being said, we made it a part of the project to include uh, $6 million in our, in our federal uh, grant proposal to uh, replace lost 
on street parking with by building new parking facilities um, off of Blue Hill Avenue in city owned uh, parcels that were vacant. So we, we thought we had a solution there. Uh, but, but one thing that became clear once we kind of came out with these numbers was that you know having a, num a big number like 250 parking spaces, that's a pretty powerful number for opponents of the project to kind of use and, 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 and put out there. And that was one of, again, the many things that kind of um, you know, poisoned, uh, poisoned the process and, and ultimately led at the request of elected officials in the corridor, ultimately led us to, um, to drop the project in October of 2009. Um, a much happier experience for me is the, is the ongoing Silverline Gateway project. Uh, this is a project that I'm happy to say uh, last December, uh, Governor Patrick announced the Commonwealth's commitment to implement this project. This is a it's an $83 million project that will extend uh, Silverline service from the existing waterfront service that operates in South Boston and the Seaport District uh, over to uh, East Boston and Chelsea with, with a stop at Airport Station so people can make transfers from the Blue Line to access employment in the Seaport. Uh, East Boston residents will be able to access it. And then the centerpiece of this project is a 1.1 is a .1 mile long dedicated busway in Chelsea. Now in Chelsea, unlike uh, Roxbury, Dorchester, Mattapan, we benefited from having a, an unused railroad right of way that kind of crossed through Chelsea, so we were able to, to make use of that and, and not, um, not impact parking. Um, however, when we started the process, when we started the alternatives analysis process, we did look at, a, at an entirely on-street alternative um, as well as a hybrid. The uh, on-street alternative would have resulted in uh, taking about 80 parking spaces, virtually uh, all the parking on Central Avenue in Chelsea. And, um, you know, probably fortunately for me, since I was the one, you know, kind of leading the public process, the, the busway alternative ended up faring the best in our analysis. It had the highest ridership, it had the, uh, the best reliability, the best travel times. And, um, and, and it was clear that, it was clear to us that the right solution in this quarter was not the on-street alternative. Um, that being said, the public and city officials and other stakeholders also made it very clear to us that, that, that the on-street alternative was not going to be the best solution for this corridor. So had we, had we gone down that route, I think it, would have, uh, it probably would have ended similarly to, to 28X. Um, but there was one element of the on-street alternative that really intrigued us and, and intrigued um, Secretary Davey and, and others of us at MassDOT, and it was um, right in the heart of downtown Chelsea in Bellingham Square, um, similar to the situation we talked about with the 28X where there's multiple uh, key bus routes. Uh, three of the 15 key bus routes operate um, through downtown Chelsea, um, the 111, the 116, and the 117, and the streets do get very congested in here. Um, and we, we identified an element of the on-street alternative um, that we really liked, which was a, a two block long uh, dedicated bus lane on Hawthorne Street, uh, kind of approaching Bellingham Square. And uh, this, is a, this is a stretch where, you know, if you're thinking about moving people versus moving vehicles, you're starting to see some parity in numbers. There's about 4,000 bus passengers a day that, that ride through these two blocks, whereas there's about 7,000 vehicles. So it's not a 50-50 split, but the numbers start to get close enough that you, know, you, you have an opportunity to make a, an improvement for one, one group of folks. So we were interested in trying to do that. Um, and Bellingham Square kind of seems like an, an, an ideal place to try to do this. Um, you know, it's, it's surrounded by very dense residential. It's probably the densest residential community you see outside of central Boston. Um, and, and by virtue of having these three key bus routes, there's, there's almost nowhere within a mile or two that you couldn't get on a bus every five or 10 minutes and travel to Bellingham Square. And I, I as an East Boston resident, I, I do spend some time over in Bellingham Square and, I, and I, I definitely enjoy it, but it's hard to argue that Bellingham Square as a commercial district has a catchment area, you know, that's, you know, it's not a 10 mile catchment area that it, that it has. It's, it's probably pulling people in from a relatively, you know, tight geography. So this would seem to be a natural place to, to make some of those trade-offs. Um, and the trade-off was gonna be losing 14 parking spaces in, uh, in the commercial district. This is just a kind of picture of what, how, how the street operates today. Um, you've got two park, you've got parking on both sides of the street, and then you have this sort of overly wide 19 foot travel lane in the middle that sometimes people use it as two lanes, sometimes there's double parking, and, but, but regardless, traffic's not moving kind of quickly through there. And we had proposed to take out the parking on the left side of the street. It's a, it's a one way street, by the way. Um, take out parking on one side of the street create a kind of shared bike uh, bus lane for two blocks and um, 
and that was going to that was going to come at the expense of 14 spaces. Um, the uh, this was a hard sell. Um, the city we primarily worked with the city of Chelsea, and they've been a huge uh, a huge help in advancing the Silverline Gateway project. They've been great partners uh, to MassDOT on the project. Um, but they they asked us point blank, you know, what's why would we do this? What's going to be the benefit of doing this? And the reality is the numbers are, they're pretty small. They're, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, in, in off-peak periods, you're talking about saving a matter of seconds by having this dedicated lane. You know, maybe in, in con periods of higher congestion, it gets up to be two to three minutes. Um, as a transit rider, I think, you know, for short trips to be able to save two, three minutes, that could be a, a 10, 20% uh, time saving. So I, I think it's not insignificant. Um, but it's hard to it's hard to kind of win the day uh, with with those numbers at least at least the way that you know our you know maybe some some municipal officials think about uh, parking today and um, and ultimately we ended up um, not pursuing the bus lane anymore. It became clear that the city was not comfortable with the change and other stakeholders in downtown weren't comfortable with it. So we ended up pulling back that improvement. Um, so that's my other sad story about parking um, and BRT. And, uh, but not all of the stories are, are totally sad. Um, the, uh, there's a couple, you know, couple good, good news stories out there. One was the, uh, the SL4, which, is the, uh, which we implemented around the same time we were pursuing the 28X. And this is a, a new branch of the, the Silver Line Washington service that kind of veers over to South Station using Essex Street through Chinatown. And um, I'm not really sure how we were able to do it, but we, we, we got a dedicated bus lane on Essex Street that, that knocked out all the on-street parking on the left side of Essex. So that was, that was a pretty significant win for us. And I, you know, I was encouraged when the service opened because we had, this, we had this painted bus lane and it seemed like other vehicles were actually respecting that lane uh, when it opened. However, the Hong Luck House, for anyone who's familiar with the Chinatown area, there's been const construction going on there for about three years now on a development on the right side of Essex, which has narrowed the roadway. And effectively, everybody, all, all traffic has been using this bus lane for the past three years. So it, we'll have to wait and see whether people kind of respect it uh, once it's over. Uh, I talked about the key bus routes, and that's a, uh, with stimulus, uh, with the stimulus program, another thing the MBTA pursued was, was making kind of targeted smaller scale improvements on those 15 key bus routes. And sometimes that came at that, that. Sometimes that required us to to uh, to remove some on street parking. Um, it ended up sort of being a wash overall on the program. But but um, particularly on the routes where we use longer sixty foot vehicles, we had to lengthen a lot of bus stops, and there there was some resistance to that. But that was that's an example of us kind of working with the city of Boston and, and other municipalities and kind of pushing forward and getting those um, those changes made. And then a couple other things ongoing now. The, the Bar Foundation has actually been uh, funding a project that the that I, that the Institute for Transportation and Development Policy has been working on to identify you know where where else in Boston would be our, could BRT work and not just where where could it work but you know they're, they're really working to try to identify non governmental champions of BRT because there's this sense that you know you know. Me and, and maybe not just you know maybe not just me um, even even someone who's a much better speaker and uh, convincer than I am if you're coming in representing the government it's it seems like there's you know there's not a lot of confidence that we're going to be able to seal the deal with with local communities and 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 remove parking so we're trying to so the bar foundation process is trying to identify other stakeholders who can kind of communicate the benefits of why this is a good thing for for communities so uh, and they're they're looking at doing. Uh, they're they're starting out by looking at doing very aggressive things when it comes to parking and, and travel lanes. So I'm I'm hopeful that that process uh, moves in a moves in a good direction. We'll have to stay tuned. And then of course there's a number of other cities around the country that are pursuing uh, bus rapid transit to varying degrees of success. Um, Chicago uh, Transit Authority is pursuing a pretty aggressive long BRT corridor along Ashland. Um, uh, Ashland Boulevard, and um, I guess the good news there is that the pushbacks because of lost turning lanes, not because of parking. So maybe that's a step in the right direction. And I'll just close with, um, you know, just my general thoughts on BRT. I think that we, uh, you know, we have a we have a number of kind of fairly unique challenges in the Boston area when it comes to doing BRT generally. Um, you know, we don't have a lot of wide streets, so obviously the narrower your streets are, the tougher the choices uh, start to become. We don't have a grid either, which I think as we start to see growth in bicycling accommodation and other, other ways to use the street, it's, it's harder to say, well, we'll just shift that use over a block because the next block over, 
might be a mile away, and, and you know, it's it's not really this, the same kind of flexibility we'd have with a grid. We also have like a fairly we also have a fairly robust you know rail rapid transit network compared to a lot of other cities. So we are in many cases our best corridors to do these types of improvements have already you know they're already hosting uh, rail rail service. And then we also have we also have municipal fragmentation, and in, in, in that sometimes some of our corridors go across municipal boundaries. We also don't have uh, the city and Mass are never on the same team in the way that say in Chicago CTA and and Chicago Department of Transportation is kind of on the same the same team. But as it relates to parking, I think the you know the issues that I talked about earlier, it's that you know travel time savings are pretty modest, even for a project like the 28X. We were talking you know six or seven minutes of travel time savings. Um, reliability improvements are, are a big benefit of doing this, but it's hard to communicate that to the public. And then, um, at least in the communities I've worked in, Chelsea, East Boston, Roxbury, Dorchester, Mattapan, they're lower income communities where it's, we found it challenging to get your sort of everyday bus rider, everyday transit rider out to community meetings to at least stand up and say, hey, you know, I don't own a car, I don't care if you're gonna take parking, I think this is a great idea because it's gonna, you know, help my, my transit ride. We seem to have trouble kind of getting those folks out, out to meetings. Um, so the people we do get at meetings tend to be people who own cars and are worried about the impacts on driving. So uh, that's all I got. Thanks. Uh, last but not least, our uh, next speaker is Melissa Tentaculous from Lexington. Hi hey everyone, thanks for being here today. I was so excited to be part of the group of people who are talking about things outside the box. Um, and when they asked me to come here, uh, it was really because, um, you know, where we did this first parklet was in uh, Lexington. Um, let's see here, just arrows, okay. What, a parklet in Lexington? You know, um, we heard about it obviously. San Francisco, New York, Cambridge, Boston, wouldn't they be the first? And um, part of why I'm here is really to communicate the kind of the story of how we can look at this. And a lot of what, if you were early on here um, at Stephanie Pollock's conversation and what she was talking about, the rationale of bringing these two things together really public spaces and economic development. I'm the economic development director for the town of Lexington, and so most people think, well, Melissa, you know, you're just about jobs and tax base. You know, what are you thinking about public, public space projects? Well, that's where that rationale that um, Stephanie talked about will come in. But let me just take a couple, you know, kind of tour you a little bit through Lexington. This is um, Mass Avenue as you look west. Pretty basic, pretty quintessential New England. You know, there is walkability on either, ooh, either sides. Well, that was my big reveal, okay? <laughs> so if you can see this, um, let's see here. Where is the marker? Top. Did I get it? Okay, in that corner you'll see it be right there, there's some bikes. You can see some activity that might look a little unusual. So what we did, we brought in the state's first parklets. So this converted two parking spaces into bike parking for almost 20 bikes and outdoor seating for um, about 15 people if you really maxed it out. I'm gonna show you these pictures because I think this is kind of what you know people are you know looking for and then I'll take you through a little bit of the rationale but mostly Stephanie talked to that and um, then just kind of how we bucketed our approach to get here. Um, this is more of a, this was an interim picture actually when the sides had, ooh, when the sides hadn't gone up yet, if you can see that. And um, there we go. And so this hadn't gone up, but this is kind of a bike center picture. So you can see it's right adjacent to parking spaces. It was closer to a fire hydrant. So we had a little extra footage there and pretty basic in terms of its design. Um, you know, nothing fancy, movable furniture, and then the green that kind of really softened it up with the plantings. Um, this is into its usage really more into the summer months. This is actually parking day during that time. Um, but what's cool about this, I mean, not only is it used here, you can see bikes back there, which is more of a hybrid of a bike corral and outdoor seating. But this guy, he's on a wheelchair. I mean, and he's act interacting with the people who are now seated here, which was, I thought, just kind of an interesting, you know, um, intersection. It was like, okay, a lot of the um, ADA folks had 
some trouble with our surface and the disconnect and the worried about the gap between um, this actual decking part and how it interacted. But you know, folks like him ha came up and he's like, this is fascinating. This is way, a way for me to be outside and interact um, and just enjoy um, being outdoors. Um, our grand opening was in June, June 15th. And this is the process how we put, to, we put it together. Um, we used, you know, bison. It was prefab for the most of most of it. It wasn't, again, elaborately designed. There had been talk of doing it, you know, maybe a more of a community design competition. Um, but then there was this, you know, compelling reason to say, let's try to keep it simple, keep it more just like a deck or a porch. So we went in with this option. Um, the rationale, you know, again, who said that you can't have, you can't have um, a presentation without Jane Jacobs in it. Um, I think what's interesting is I've come to this job as a planner. So I did, you know, as economic development, it's not only jobs and tax base. You know, it's a big picture. It's a comprehensive approach. And looking at how we use public space as a way to enrich you know, our cultural amenities and the economic activity, the business activity within our center. For those of you who don't know, Lexington obviously has rich American history, but the center as a natural kind of elements, the bones of that structure, is a huge asset to the town. And how do we keep it fresh? How do we enliven it? How do we keep the businesses um, engaged? I think that's a big part of what um, motivated us to go look into a public space project. The economic benefits, I want to just, again, the rationale was also to start bridging that gap between, you know, this is not just, oh, you know, it feels better to have a bike out here. No, there is an economic benefit to this. Businesses do benefit. And so this one was actually just from the Oregon Transportation Research and Education Consortium, where there was a woman starting to look at spending habits of people by their mode. And what you see is, yes, maybe an a uh, single occupant vehicle may spend a little more on their visit, but their visits are not as frequent as a pedestrian, as the cyclist, because their interactions with their community, it's much more on a human scale. Their passage by, oh, that dry cleaner down the road that they see because they're passing by in a little bit of a slower pace, maybe that the average vehicle zooming by does not notice. And so that's part of what um, is coming from this kind of study. Stephanie, she also brought this up. This is, again, just highlighting the fact that when you do bring in the amenities and the infrastructure for cyclists in particular here, um, New York studies really have started to try to document and create new metrics for the economic benefit of these um, accommodations. Here um, we have, obviously, this one. Maybe Dan could speak to a little bit more in terms of plaza. This was an old parking lot that they converted into a plaza. Here is the parking or parklet that converted several parking spaces um, into an outdoor seating exclusively. Ours was kind of riffing off this with bike parking and um, the outdoor seating. But again, a lot of those elements are similar. You know, the plantings, the uh, movable furniture. Um, let's see here. So what I wanted to share was our six-step approach. It's really not <laughs> a step approach, but it's a way to kind of bucket and try to, you know, after kind of going through this process, what we tried to do was bucket what we did in little, you know, kind of digestible chunks, if you will. So um, number one, just kind of linking it to what we did was linking it to our economic development goal. You know, the selectmen, your elected officials, you know, buy in and they set up some strategies, some long-term goals. Is it about the vitality of your center? How do you keep that center vi vital? You know, and you're breaking down these pieces a little bit more. And what we're seeing is when you are able to tie these back into larger goals the, that are the blueprints for your community, you get a little bit more traction than you would saying you're doing this independent project on its own, right? So you kind of fit it into the bigger puzzle. Um, two, partnering with a local business. Um, I can't stress how critical this component is. Um, at least, again, this is from my experience. Um, what we did, not only with Ride Studio, ooh, Ride Studio Cafe, 
um, was an interesting retail shop on its own. Um, it was there, it started before I got there, and it was a hybrid coffee shop and bike, high-end coffee, high-end bikes. Um, and so they kind of got the fact that their patrons kind of appreciated having some more bike parking. Um, so they came to me and they're like, oh, can we get some, you know, maybe a few more bike racks, you know. I know one year we actually got one parking space that we were able to put some bikes in there. Do you think we can do that? Um, so with this kind of, kind of partner that you had, some interest, they kind of got the fact that maybe they don't need that parking space right in front of their business, that they could benefit from another way of using that space. So we started talking, you kind of have to, at this point, you have to kind of bring out your very much, your, you know, your not, not salesman kind of approach, but definitely your inner personal, you know, um, extrovert, I guess, to really start communicating with the businesses and expressing, you know, what you'd like to do, what's possible with these areas. Um, because, you know, a, this is what, she, what we piloted before we actually did the um, parklet, um, was the bike corral. We kind of riffed on what her request was. We talked to the adjacent communities. But if you're not engaging those businesses from the start and they don't get it and you don't want it or you put something in the middle of nowhere without a nice symbiotic use, you're not going to get any action. You can have the most beautiful parklet and if it's in the back corner of a parking lot not in next to anything that people really want to engage with, it will not be a successful place. Um, it's very critical that when you're thinking of retail, in particular retail these days, because retail is in flux. We'll notice a lot of um, commercial in the trade and retail sales are obviously moving to online as an online tra transaction. But when you're moving to retail and looking at your spaces now, it's much more experiential based. What are you gaining from that going down into town center or you know, even you know, the mall, even Assembly Square? What are you gaining from that? It's experience. It's kind of that enjoyment factor that you can't get for the cheap you know, iPod or iPhone you know, bought on, you know, online in your living room. So you had to start thinking about these things. That's, so that's why I want to really stress the nature and where you're locating it and that partnership with the business. Um, collaboration and support and building support, you know, from, you know, from a planner's perspective, from an elected official's perspective, um, and, you know, any kind of position that you kind of can feel yourself as being a little bit more of a generalist is great because that way you can be the one who's kind of threading through the different goals. You are able to help identify people and help, help them identify the common goals. You have tourism. You don't think automatically tourism and the bike committee have the same goals. But you start to think about, okay, well, well, for Lexington at least, we have the bikeway, right? Um, the bikeway, having people come into the center. We have a lot of visitors. You know, there's only 33,000 residents in Lexington. The town center cannot thrive on its own with 33,000 residents. And I've been telling them that for a while now. They need to embrace the fact that they have to invite and be a welcoming space for not just every, you know, the people from Minnesota, but from their neighbors. I mean, it's, this is kind of where we have to have this collaborative approach. Um, so you're the one, and in my case, I was the one trying to bring, you know, the center committee. Vitality, vitality, vitality. Well, well, what does that mean when you talk to them? Well, it's having people enjoy the center. Um, keeping it relevant. Um, for, the, for the suburbs, Places like, um, you may have heard of the urban-suburban approach to suburbs these days. You know, um, Burlington, for example, and Third Avenue, they're really kind of recreating a town center feel, almost like an outdoor lifestyle mall. You have, you know, places like Assembly Square that's really trying to create a rich environment for people to hang out in. And so if you break that down, the center committee was really wanting that for the town, Lexington Town Center as well. So you, know, so you start piecing those two pieces together with tourism. Tourism wants to obviously be friendly and welcoming and have people linger. 
Um, you know, police and DPW, those are a little tougher to uh, get on board with a parklet. Um, but, you know, it is possible. So, and then I think just recently there was a Boston Globe article, Metro West section, um, talking about how parklets are now becoming a little bit more standardized. And so even some of the engineering standards now are looking at how you can incorporate parklets in a safer way. Um, Pilot, pilot, pilot. So that's the other thing, is just say that we're gonna try it out. Try it out on a small scale way. This way, you know, we put, oh, I put um, this picture up because as I mentioned, the Ride Studio Cafe, they wanted some more bike parking. Instead of saying, here's a few bike um, racks, what we tried to do was cordon off an area to say, you know, try to enliven it. Um, we did this over, you know, it actually we didn't just do the pilot or the parklet over, overnight. It took three summers. There was a small one day pilot that we did. We came back this summer, built on that. And then we obviously used, um, let's see here, parking day um, as a pilot. A great opportunity to use a pilot. It's one day, the nation, the world, the globe is doing it. You can point to all these great places around um, really truly around the world that is trying to you know change the, you know do the pavement to park um, approach with different things obviously like Stephanie said the park light is the tip of the iceberg um, but it's fun and if it's in the right spot it's not only visible that creates a fresh interest to that area you know, promotes the business activity, but also promotes and kind of sends a signal that, hello, we are rethinking how um, we use our public spaces. And we, and through this, we also are supporting alternative modes of transportation by taking those two vehicle spaces and turning them into bike parking for nearly 20. So this is, you know, this picture I ever like, it's hard to see, but this <laughs> in Lexington um, is pretty rare to have a really active nightlife past you know, the dark evening hours, but that was very much activated and very much used. Um, five, uh, just document your success. No matter what you're doing, even if you do it on one day, you know, plan for the day before, take some numbers, get some pedestrian counts, get some bike counts, get do document that to have quantitative, mm, chunks and nuggets of information that you can go back and tell people, hey, there is a difference when we do this. Um, so through our, you know, through our pilot and trying to document this with uh, um, at least the pilot corral, we had a 60% increase in bike activity on that corner. And then I say, you know, build on this success. So when I said it took three summers, kind of we did it incrementally, right? So that third summer, we didn't just keep it as, you know, bike parking exclusively, we introduced the seating because that, you know, during that um, parking day, we had introduced some seating, which was successful. And we were able to show that it was um, utilized through the documentation of these numbers and that activity. Um, so those are the kind of questions I would just ask yourself, you know, how does the project align with your um, economic development goals? Um, who is your local business partner? You know, who will work with you and who will also be the champion, the steward of this space? And you know, how will you collaborate and build support for the project? Really, if it's not you, if you don't feel comfortable doing it, who on your team does that? Who you know, can be that, space, that person that kind of starts to break the ice, go to the businesses, explain what you want to do? So um, those are some things to think about. And with that, I will turn it over to the panel and Dan. So in my haste to begin the session, actually, uh, I had to ask Megan, but um, I'd never even introduced myself. My name is Dan Bartman. <laughs> I'm a senior planner with the city of Somerville. Uh, and the three presentations you just heard were all about thinking out of, outside the box when it comes to repurposing land that is dedicated to parking. And um, we thought it was an important session because uh, especially in inner core towns and cities, uh, land is actually our most limited resource that we have. And uh, if the cultural and demographic changes that are, are you know, taking hold of our cities uh, continue, then we're gonna have to think, continue to think outside the box as it comes to repurposing parking uh, space and for other uses. And I think that there, to summarize the talks that you just had was uh, that there's really two types of um, repurposed, and re repurposed types of parking projects. Uh, and those are the heavy lifts, which are 
for instance, the installation of bus rapid transit uh, in, in limited right-of-ways or uh, infill development on, on land that was previously dedicated to parking. And then the other thing is um, uh, things like parklets and pop-up plazas like we've done in Somerville, which are pilot projects and you get away with a lot more when you can claim it's a, a pilot project. Uh, one of the lessons that I think that New York has taught us is that the more successful pilot projects that you can uh, carry out, uh, the more trust you gain with your citizenship and the more they'll let you do the harder lift projects like bus rapid transit or infill. Um, with that, I'll actually turn it over to the crowd so that we, can, we, only ha we have about 10 or 12 minutes left. So, In the back? That's you. <laughs> In the uh, winter, what uh, happens to the parklet? Oh, good question. This is a seasonal uh, parklet. So it is open from May to uh, the end of October. And so our DPW guys collapse it, store it um, on premise, on their premise. And so what happens to the space used for parking again? Reverts back to parking, yeah. Uh, the question is, it seems like we, today, we all kind of know the right things to do and the right reasons to do it. It seems like the main thing standing in our way is politics. Politics and parking. So I guess my question is like you had a great example of like building community support with Rise Studio Cafe. Um, you know, what can we do to I guess build that political support more quickly and effectively? Because it's great that you got it done. I happen to live in that park like all of last summer. Oh but, great. Um, but uh, you know how can we do it without having to take two or three years to build support with the community. I've had some, I've had some thoughts on that, um, only because I think one thing that um, I think kind of government kind of fails to miss sometimes is engaging our youth a little bit. So, you know, the high school is actually a great resource. Those guys are thinking about sustainability. They're thinking about public art. And when um, a community, you know, that prides themselves on education, you know, and is somehow you know, collaborating with the students and creating a pilot project, I think that could be really interesting and actually be a little bit more quickly um, adopted as a pilot and then you build off that. I still say the pilot works. You know, anything you do on a little bit more of a trial basis doesn't sound as threatening. Did you want to add anything? Uh, yeah, um, well, it's... <laughs> I, I was more interested to hear some some ideas since we have since we've sort of failed at uh, winning. Uh, winning <laughs> I could I could talk more. I don't want to yeah, hog no, it. I mean, no, I think I think for me it, it goes back again. Uh, these the two projects I talked about being in lower income communities. The political dynamic was very different, and and I think that we were dealing with a, an environment where the the people who were politic there wasn't a there wasn't a big overlap between the types of people in those communities who were politically engaged and the types of people who were going to benefit from our project. So it might be you know in like a Lexington or Wellesley you might. There might be some more overlap between the types of people who might get out there and use the parklet or, or walk around the downtown, um, um, and the types of people who are politically engaged and, and kind of make noise politically. But in, in these in my corridors, there wasn't as, there wasn't that much overlap. So, um, yeah. and mostly I'll just add to Melissa's point. It's really about collaboration. One of the things that we had initiated as part of the Linden Square process, which really has carried on um, since then, really been. Um, effective for us over the past 10 years is we created something out of that from on a staff level that really grew. It was called a T-DIRT, a town development review team, which was initially just getting everyone in the room. So, and then that branched out. Once you had a public hearing and you really could tick off what the, what the concerns were from the neighbors, from um, uh, an arch architectural standpoint, from a noise standpoint, um, we could collaborate in terms of how are we gonna handle those. So one thing we did was this development agreement which to try and handle some of the neighbor's concerns um, and as well as the town's concerns in terms of uses is the development agreement limited um, the types of uses. So even if uh, we had restaurants per se, we specifically said, okay, you can have six restaurants total. And we went to the ITE manual and said, based upon these use codes from a quick serve standpoint, a family dining experience, um, a quick serve, these are the types of uses that are allowed. And so outside of zoning, um, in collaboration with the neighbors, as well as the various boards, because we're very decentralized, um, we don't have a town manager structure, so really each board is um, held to their own standard. Um, that, really, that model and the collaboration and really 
the public hearing process in itself, I think at the end, Eastern Development at the time, it said, geez, I think we attended 150 meetings. So it's also, if you're partnering on a development standpoint, it's really sending them out into the community um, to try and sell the project that you've agreed upon. In the purple scarf. I'm just interested in uh, what were some of your funding sources for these things? I heard yeah. you say yeah. Well, we had, we had pursued, uh, we'd pursued economic stimulus funding, the federal economic stimulus dollars to do the 28X project. The Silver Line Gateway is being funded uh, with entirely with state funding from the, you know, the, 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 the legislature's funding bill from last year, the new, what we call the way forward funds, so. Uh, ours was a, a private, privately funded development, um, you know, it, it was essentially turned into be essentially like a lifestyle uh, mall retail complex. So uh, there was no town fund except for those, um, for, for the town meeting expenses, which were then reimbursed um, once the permits were received. Uh, for our parklet, we did, the structure was a little different. We um, specifically had, it with very much, um, intention was it was a public space project so the town paid for it um, it was approximately twenty four thousand dollars all said and done um, and we did have donations from the plantings and the um, furnishing um, but that's something that is a little different than some of the bigger cities um, have done if you fo you know follow the parklet programs um, so Boston's here, she could talk to that um, a little bit more. And I think that's just different because we don't, we don't have a lot of spaces that we see this fitting in so that there would be constant demand for it. So that's partly why we approached it that way. Uh, I should just add the funding for the master plans that we did. That was about um, a $20,000. The vision of master plan was a $20,000 capital expense in Wellesley for the Linden Street plan. Um, I, uh, Melissa alluded to this, but uh, some of what the larger cities did with parklets and especially a lot of the pop-up uh, projects is that they demonstrate one and then they create a program that allows the community to come to them and say, we would like to do this. And so then you effectively give, you know, offload the cost onto them by demonstrating that it's something that you're willing to partner with them uh, in doing. So you'll, you'll streamline the permit process, for instance, for somebody to utilize the space within the right of way uh, if they are willing to be a partner and claim ownership of it and pay, and pay for it, the price of construction. And less guitarist for the public health. I'm sorry for asking a lot of questions, but I love the topic. I don't know if you here. Pre and post counts, so incredibly important even for BRT. And this is another count that I would like you to consider. We do a lot of economic development pre and post. We do a lot of counts of people. What we're not remembering is 68% of the population is overweight. And obesity leads to diabetes, stroke, cancer, and even things like Alzheimer's. We want to prevent all of those diseases. So we want to have people burn as many calories as possible. When we look at a parking lot and we look at a vacant car, that's zero calorie burning. Nobody's in that car doing anything. If a person's driving a car, that's what's called two mets. We're all at one mat because we're all sitting, so we're at resting heart rate. When you go to a parklet, you're walking to get there. So you've got your distance to walk there. You're at about two to three mets. If you bike on a cycle track, that's eight mets to get there. So you could do your actual string across the road and do your calorie burning on your net capacity but you could also do your travel time to and from, and you could do the same thing with bus rapid transit, because if you're standing, it's about two mets. If you're one, it's one met. But that density of that bus rapid transit, if it's like Curitiba or Bogota, and it's packed, it's a lot of calories being burned, and a lot of calories also getting to the bus, compared to that zero mets for the space that's taken up by the parked car. And we looked at all those pictures of vacant parking lots. Every single vacant parking space is zero mets compared to, let's say, an apartment complex that we saw this morning, or an office complex. They're all high calorie burning compared to that vacant apartment. Um, 
I, I think that's a great point, actually. I think, if anything, you brought that up a couple times, and um, Aran from MIT had brought that up in his presentation to some degree. There was a picture there just saying, like, you burn X number of calories from this economy lot to whatever your destination is. Um, you know, I have to, I did fail to say that the parking, a park let did not go without controversy. This is a very, I mean, we're in Lexington, there's only two buses and there's no rail whatsoever. So to lose two parking spaces in the center of town, which was very visible, was very dramatic. Um, and we had a lot of people say that this was an absurd idea, that I was crazy. Um, so, but what we did, and I tried to stay committed to this, was that you know there was a public benefit for it, not only for the wellness of the people, you know, being outdoors, but that you know that in the, like what um, Don Shub talks about, the comprehensive approach to parking, want, you know, is not just about providing all this space for vehicles. It's also reducing the demand for those spaces for vehicles. So the more you provide those bike options, then the more then obviously you have space, you know, the spaces to, you know, kind of do some more creative things with. So that was part of my message. And, you know, I think with that comprehensive program, we are looking at economy lots and I think kind of that public benefit of walking and moving is definitely being more incorporated now that I've been here today, so. I know it was built all of this at once, and if someone said that it was originally proposed to have a roundabout, uh, did, was that so, did you, are you sorry it didn't have a roundabout? Or do you think that three parts of it, do you think it would work as a, as a retrofit in other situations to do that thing where you take the front of the uh, property and, and build it out? Okay, so it was, it was a phase construction, so, um, because it's north and south, essentially, it's north of Linden Street, south of Linden Street, the major component was Roach Brothers. So we never wanted to shut down operations of the business. So they built out the north um, side of the street first, um, moved the operation, Roach Brothers, and, and then began the south. Um, so, so it was a bit of a phased construction. Um, there, there was, uh, the initial plans did call for a roundabout um, where we have a, have a light now. Um, I was a huge proponent of that, um, and uh, so was the planning director, Rick Brown, at the time. And that was just too much to get through um, to the neighbors. They, you know, the middle school um, is drop-off driven, and they just said, we cannot imagine going through that. Um, that was a letdown of the project, although now I, I question if it would have worked as efficiently as I, as I think we had thought, um, given the volume of traffic on the street. Um, I do think it could be retrofit. Mo many of those buildings were retrofit. Um, the Roach Brothers was new and the two front buildings. The majority of the other structures have been retained. Um, and in the initial plan, the Volkswagen was, was set to be skinned and, and sort of um, altered use. And that's being retained and we're working now through permitting on that. Um, so essentially there was, you know, three new buildings. Um, actually, there was also an affordable housing component on the site, which um, included on the site four uh, affordable units that are in uh, two, two structures, which are, uh, are lead silver. Um, so I do think, you know, it was a, it's a sort of a unique project that it, it did try and, it did, wasn't a clear demo of the site. It did retain um, a good portion, over 50% of the structures on site. South side gets improved a bit more? Um, well, the south side was largely um, improved, it, totally new exteriors. They've done um, additions. There are, uh, there is one essentially new building, and um, the VW is the remaining component. I, I don't see too much more work going on there. They, they went back and added some additional landscaping. The, the odd shape from where it had been the railroad spur, it's, it's, it has a, um, and the original building placement, doesn't allow for a lot of um, modification. And I think if you brought those buildings closer to the road, it, it wouldn't actually be as efficient as um, we had, a, as it sort of laid out, yeah. Uh, we have one minute left if there are any last remaining questions. Go ahead. <laughs> 
frustrating about the failure of that plan on, on Blue Hill Avenue is that actually that neighborhood, probably I think more than half of the uh, adult population there he doesn't own or have access to a car. Because um, it's something like the car ownership rate is like 35% of households don't have one and 45% of households have one. Mm -hmm. uh, which should mean that most people who live in that neighborhood and vote presumably uh, take the bus. Um, so I'm kind of thinking, my own experience in trying to advocate for this, often if you run up against this wall that the, the citizens would want the bus, but their elected representatives, it's like uh, um, we were talking about before, people who either fall into the camp of owning a car and not being able to understand not owning a car, and people who are, don't own a car and can't imagine the alternative. Um, so have you supported the bus and believe that I mean, it sounds like you did try to do a little bit to uh, reach out to the citizens there who are taking the bus, and that's always pretty challenging mm -hmm. to attend to you know, or, or after they don't go to a lot of community meetings. But um, it seems like also there would be, it would be worth fighting to get those people to communicate better with their own elected representatives who themselves probably can't actually imagine just how dependent their own um, constituents are on that bus. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I, I think, you know, one thing we, we did do is we did sort of aggressively go to the riders where they were. We rode buses and interviewed people. We went to Dudley Square and hung on interview people. So we were able to get a lot of input from riders, and they were all on board with the idea, but it was tough to get that input and validated in the sort of traditional public meeting, which tends to be the meetings the elected officials attend and where they're really looking to feel a bit more confident about the idea. I think that two things that would be helpful going forward, one is having examples of BRT somewhere. Like once we can get it done somewhere, we can then point to it, much like people will now be able to go to Lexington and see what a park what it looks like and, and realize it's not so scary or, you know, and, and maybe Megan to a certain extent you were able to build off of, you know, what had happened in Porter Square with that, with that parking lot. I don't know whether that was something you guys referenced, but once there's something out there that looks like BRT, it makes it easier for us to kind of make, make the argument. And then, but, but I agree. I think that when I look at the, the, um, organization and the the passion of bicycle advocates in the in the Boston area and compare that to the the advocacy on the transit side it's it's like night and day and the, the transit advocates they don't they don't organize and go out around the city wherever the meetings are and, and advocate in this as, as effectively as the bike advocates do and I think that that's you know and that that's actually in some ways adds another challenge to doing BRT because again we have this limited space on the right of way so if every if, if we're getting bike lanes everywhere that further reduces the opportunity for for BRT but Scott, I had a question for you. Oh, sure. Okay. Is that okay, Dion? <laughs> sure. <laughs> um, well, what about piloting that, just coning it off and trying it, say, for you know a month? Had that been obviously come up in conversation? Yeah, I mean, we haven't we haven't talked about doing that yet. I think that it, you know, again, since we're never on the same team as the municipality that we'd have to work with to change the street, I think you know we'd we'd be happy if there was a municipality, and you know, we have municipalities like Cambridge and Somerville that would seem, in theory, to be likely places to try to do that, but we haven't, it's not something we've, we've done yet or pursued seriously yet. It's a good idea though. Oh, actually, do you, have you considered just doing signal timings on that street? On which, on Blue Hill Avenue? Yeah. yeah, so the city is currently redesigning, they have a project to, to, to redesign all the signals on Blue Hill Avenue and Warren Street and tie it in with their central system. So once that is done, that's being done in a way that would support transit signal priority. And once that's done, we, you know, we intend to work with them to try to get TSP at, at those intersections. Yeah. 